Okay, so finishing up, we're just going to continue with the lymphoid leukemias. We just finished the myeloid leukemias. Um, so basically, again, this slide is just more of an introduction, which we already know. Um, so let's just kind of get into CML, CLL, excuse me, CLL. So CLL, chronic lymphocytic or lymphoid, excuse me, leukemia, um, this accounts for 30% of all cases of leukemia in the U.S., 95% are considered the malignant B cell precursors. So these are malignant B cells. And 5% are more the aggressive T cell formation. Now let me say something about B cell and T cells. When we have a leukemia that attacks B cells, that is usually a little more, I would say a little more common, okay, type of lymphoid leukemias. But at any time that we have a leukemia that attacks a T cell, it is very aggressive, very I don't want to say deadly, but not a good situation, okay? Not a good prognosis, I'll put it that way. Anytime a leukemia or a cancer attacks a T cell. And as you can imagine, T cells are very important because of what? What are some reasons why T cells are important? What is the function of a T cell? They attack invaders, but what, what, is, what in specifically do they attack? Viruses. Viruses, and keep in mind that T cells attack viruses and they also attack cancer infected cells. Mm -hmm. So it's almost the same kind of premise like how the HIV virus attacks the T cell and that the, the T cells supposed to attack the virus. So what will happen here, if it attacks a T cell, this really puts this person at a new compromised state in the situation. So it is not a good thing to have T cell uh, transformation. Okay. They say sometimes CLL is found as a routine by accident or a routine blood work. Okay, so say for example, a person just goes in for their physical, <coughs> have blood work done, peripheral smears done to kind of look at the cells, and they find out that this person has this type of leukemia. Because what happens with chronic lymphoid leukemia, these individuals don't have signs or symptoms in the beginning. Keep in mind it's a chronic long sort of onset or, or long lasting onset when this disease occurs. Symptomatic, when it does become symptomatic, they will have all the signs and symptoms of a person that, you know, has pretty much a full blown cancer. So the fatigue, weight loss, infections, all of that. Okay. Now, the malignant lymphocytes will invade lymphoid tissue and so they will get lymph adenopathy. So the lymph nodes will get very large, but uh, just to let you know, when these lymph nodes get very large, they are painless. I don't want you to think that they're painful, but it's just so much of the infiltration that's going on with the cells that they do have an extreme um, lymph adenopathy and also enlarged spleen. Okay. So bone marrow infiltration will occur. What happens here is, I would say, kind of like a hallmark of this particular disease. Um, or if you want to say the pathogenesis, is that CLL is characterized by what is called defective apoptosis and they have a longer lifespan. So what does that mean? We all know that in our immune system, our body pretty much has all of the white blood cells and all of the chemical mediators and things that are released and secreted to say and recognize, hey, we know that that cell is considered a non-self or not self-cell. So the body, as you know, will sort of mark it to be marked for apoptosis. Now, keep in mind that the immune system will attack cancer cells. It will kill some of it. But the problem is, is that with cancer cells, there's such a high degree of mitosis that it can't kill it fast enough, okay? So these cells do die. But the problem here with CLL is that these individuals are sort of like immune to apoptosis altogether. So they will not have that programmed cell death. So what will happen here is that these cells will just stay and they'll just continue having a longer lifespan and it just gets more aggressive and aggressive, okay? So this is what happens here. So here's a picture. Um, don't know if you can, I'm sorry if you can hit the mic. Have you working today? Thank you. Okay. Now with this picture here with um, CLL, okay, as you can see, what is the issue here? with these cells. Now keep in mind it's chronic so we know it's a mature cell so we already know that it is a mature lymphocytic cell. So lymphocytes in your normal morphology that you know in normal lymphocytes should look like what? What should normal lymphocytes look like? 
Should they have granules in their cytoplasm? Mm -hmm. No. No, they don't. Remember, lymphocytes do not have granules in their cytoplasm. So what should they look like? You should have cytoplasm and then what? The nucleus inside, okay? And depending on if we're talking about, uh, well, as you know, some of the agranulocytes, but lymphocytes, if we're talking about lymphocytic, they're going to have no granulars in the cytoplasm, but then also the nucleus will have one different shapes, okay, depending on if we're talking about a monocyte, it would be U-shaped, or the lymphocyte having the large nucleus, okay. Now, what is the issue here? Well, they're not granular sites, but what you're seeing here in the nucleus, you're right, it does look like granulars, but what this is, is this is actually chromatin. So what is happening is that the gene in this particular, or the genetic information in this nucleus is just sort of derailing. The chromatin is just kind of hanging around, all around the nucleus, okay? So you see what is called fine chromatin that's just sitting there in that nucleus. What else is the issue here with this cell? What is it missing? It's missing cytoplasm. It has no cytoplasm. No cytoplasm whatsoever. Okay, and as you can see, they're not exactly clustered, but just from this field of view, there's a lot of different lymphocytes in this region, okay, that really shouldn't be all clustered together. And again, if you remember from normal anatomy, it took you a long time to find a lymphocyte, okay? And if we're looking at this little piece of slide here, you can see tons of them in this uh, view. So that is the issue. And as you can see, the red blood cells are also an issue there. And as you can see, this cell here, just to let you know, is actually dead, okay? It's on its way out. You can tell the cell membrane has lysed at this point, and all the material is just kind of oozing out, okay, in the bloodstream. But, the, but what will come up, what cell should come in to sweep away that? Uh, <laughs> macrophages, very good. So macrophages will come and clean up those dead, okay, used or dried up dead cells. Okay. Now, the prognosis, they say um, here, they say certain genetic mutations can be better or worse. Um, they don't have the actual treatment here, but I do have it written down. I'm sorry, let me give it to you. The treatment is chemotherapy, and if chemotherapy doesn't work, they will use stem cell transplant. Okay, so they'll try just plain chemotherapy first, and then if the chemotherapy doesn't work, they will use stem cell transplant. Okay, so that's the treatment that's actually missing there from the slide. Okay. Now, ALL. Acute lymphoblastic, or they also say lymphocytic, okay, leukemia or the bone. This is a malignancy, okay, of the lymphoid lineage. 80% result of malignant transformation of B cell. Again, here we go. If there is T cell involvement, only 20%, but please keep in mind that T cell is very aggressive, okay. And these are abnormal lymphoblasts, and they are immature lymphocytes, as we already know, because it's an acute form. Okay. So here we go. Now, what do you see here? Okay. This just looks like nuclei, just sitting all clustered together. You can't even tell what type of cell it is. Okay, if we wanted to, um, even with the the CLL, you were able to at least determine that it was some type of lymphocyte because it did have no, even though it didn't have no cytoplasm or very little with some of them, but because you can see it was sort of forming a little bit, this you can tell is just uh, really immature. It's just a nucleus that's just sitting there. So very large, large nuclei, you see very tiny, tiny cytoplasm that's trying to form, okay? So this also makes it immature. And you can see this big cluster here, okay, that's just sitting there. We all know that's looking at something like that is definitely a malignancy, okay, um, the fact that it's all clustered together. Okay, and then we have the red blood cells in the background. Okay. Now, 
One thing I want you to know, and this is important to know, um, not only have I had it on my old tests, but also I've seen this as an inflex question, um, that ALL is the most common children leukemia. Okay, so this definitely is what we call the childhood type of leukemia, ALL. And just to let you know, um, CLL is the most common form of leukemia in adults. So ALL most common in children, CLL most common in adults. Second leading cause of death in this population, not sure what the first leading cause of death is for children. Um, peak incidence they have here between three and seven years. Okay, so unfortunately it attacks these children at a very young age. Now, sometimes people can have a second peak in the middle age, okay, and people wonder, okay, well, how does that happen? Keep in mind that when these patients do undergo treatment, so say, for example, you have a child that's six years old that is definitely diagnosed with ALL, they go through all of their uh, treatment protocol, and they are in the pretty much what is called a complete remission. They're in remission for years and years and years. And then what can happen is if that person somehow comes out of remission and then they can have a second peak. I'm not quite sure the percentage of that. Just to be honest with you, I don't know how common that happens. But they can have a second peak okay, from in middle age with the same ALL. So symptoms here. I'm going to point out because this is a childhood cancer. Bone pain. Fever, bruising, infection, the, those four are things that happen to children quite often. Okay, so nothing spectacular with children. Children may refuse to walk. Okay, that is another thing that's not uncommon with children. Loss of appetite, how many kids don't want to eat? Okay, and especially they are picky eaters. Okay, uh, fatigue, abdominal pain. Okay, now these are the other things that kind of go along with uh, adult cancers, so the enlarged spleen, liver, and lymph nodes. So once you find sort of uh, symptoms like that, then that's a little more easier to detect. But obviously, those others are not as easy. Okay. Okay. Now, 85% five-year survival rate in children, 30 to 50% in adults. Okay. Um, they do have certain forms of ALL, just like I told you, acute leukemias definitely have different subtypes. Okay, but the goal here is to definitely get them into a complete remission. Okay, now I do have some information, I'm sorry, that I want to give you as a side note to this. And I apologize, I don't have a board to write. Okay, but I need you to write this down. Children with the pre-B cell type, children with the pre-B cell type have a 90% cure rate. So children with the pre-B cell type have a 90% cure rate. A 90% cure rate. As opposed to those with the mature B cell or the immature T cell. As opposed to the ones with the mature B cell or the immature T cell. Those individuals have a poor prognosis. I'm sorry, did I, did I lose you? As opposed, to those yes. with As opposed to those with the mature B cell or the immature T cell. T cell. Those two have a poor prognosis. Okay, so remember I explained to you that there's different subtypes and so forth. Okay, and those are the different types. Pre-B cell, B cell, and T cell type. So just to give you a heads up, the pre-B cell have a 90% cure rate. Okay, so which is a good situation with those patients. Okay, now, the next type of leukemia um, is something called hairy cell leukemia. I know that sounds funny. Um, but this one is actually um, not as common, okay, even though they have it here, it is rare. Um, but it is a leukemia, highly treatable, okay, so it's okay. Uh, median age, they have here 55 years, and this is a B-cell phenotype. And what makes this what they call hairy cell leukemia is that the cells actually have this hairy looking projection that comes from off of the cytoplasm. Okay, and I'll show you a picture in a second. 
Okay, so these hairy cells are in peripheral blood and they do call, have these patients have a complete bone marrow suppression. The other thing here is that 90% of these individuals with hairy cell do have splenomegaly. Okay, so they will have a high splenomegaly with this. I would definitely put a check mark by that. So here we go with our hairy cell, leukemic cells. Okay, so here you can see the B cells, okay, that are pretty much mature. And then you'll see in the cytoplasm, it is pretty mature, but the cytoplasm is definitely uh, odd shaped. It's not nice and circular as we would like it to be. But then you'll see the cytoplasm has these sort of little hairy projections coming off of it. Okay, and it almost looks like, I don't know what that looks like, but it's sort of look free, I would say. Yeah. Okay, and then also, as you can see, these red blood cells are not in good shape, okay, behind it. Now, uh, treatment begins when the patient becomes symptomatic, so they will become symptomatic, splenomegaly, infections, bleeding, anemia, all that. And just to let you know, these patients do have a high cure rate with the treatment protocol of chemotherapy, whatever the appropriate treatment, treatment protocol that they use. So that's that. Now, this next one that we have to go over, the plasma cell myeloma, also known as multiple myeloma. Um, I remember this when I was in school. I remember they had tons of questions with this because it had a lot. Multiple myeloma is very involved. Okay. Um, just to let you know, multiple myeloma usually involves and invades the bone. So it's almost more like a bone marrow type of, of situation but it can also affect other organs as well. So let me just point those other organs out to you. It can affect the lymph nodes, liver, spleen, and kidneys. Okay, so please make sure you know that it can infect or affect, excuse me, those different areas. So they give you here exclusively in adults, usually 40 years of age, the median age is 65, and men are actually more common to getting multiple myeloma. Just in general, too, just to let you know, men are actually a little more common to getting leukemias than females. Okay, so men are usually more in that uh, category for some reason. Now, the other thing here with multiple myeloma, this is what happens. Because this is a plasma cell myeloma, plasma cell leukemia, so to speak, so plasma cells, just because it's actually floating through plasma, it actually will secrete or release a specific type of antibody that's found, okay? So this antibody can be detected when this person is infected with this sort of cancer. So I want to go over that because that's quite important. So they will produce what is called an excessive identical monoclonal antibodies. This will be detected and it can accumulate in the bloodstream. And it can also be detected during proton, excuse me, protein, excuse me, electrophoresis. What does that mean? <clears throat> I don't know if you um, ever seen electrophoresis. If you probably did this, maybe if you took biology as an experiment, electrophoresis pretty much is when they have this sort of expensive machine that they hook it up to the specialized paper, and basically you put on this special paper. Um, maybe drops of blood or drops of whatever types of fluid and basically what it'll do is it'll extract whatever type of proteins okay that is actually made up of that particular fluid so basically it will actually show in this situation electrophoresis will show what type of antibody that is in the blood okay so they'll just kind of put the blood through this electrophoresis machine so when it does that once they do the electrophoresis, they will see large amounts of antibodies that form sort of what is called a characteristic spike. So it'll actually come up the paper like a graph. So they'll just see a long line that just kind of sticks up, and that tells us, okay, this person has a high amount of this particular antibody. Now, keep in mind that this antibodies, okay, as we know, definitely uh, also that forms and makes this made up of proteins, they do have also what is called the Bench Jones protein, okay, that also produces this sort of light chain antibody. This protein can be found in the blood and urine. So if you had a patient with a multiple myeloma doing blood work, and obviously a urinalysis is extremely important to look for this protein, okay. 
and not just protein that a person that's a diabetic looking for that kind of protein, but this is a specific protein because of the type of antibody that their blood is producing. Okay, so this is Bench Jones protein. This helps confirm the diagnosis. Now, they can also accumulate in the kidneys and damage. So as you can imagine, this protein is probably not just a little tiny thing. It's probably a very large molecule, okay, of this sort of Bench Jones protein that is not familiar with going through the kidney, or the kidney's not familiar with the protein. So it's definitely going to try to, uh, it definitely will damage the protein as it's trying to go through the glomerulus and that whole thing, okay. So understand that these patients can also have kidney damage with this leukemia, okay. Now, the other issue here is that this type of malignant plasma cells can accumulate in the bone and give these patients pathological fracture. Not sure if you went over this in anatomy, but the difference between a pathological fracture as opposed to a traumatic fracture, pathological fractures come from a disease process. So something is causing a breakdown in the bone. So say, for example, a person that has ex extreme osteoporosis, and they just walk in and all of a sudden have a fracture in their leg for whatever reason. That is not considered a traumatic fracture. It will be considered a pathological fracture because the disease process caused the fracture. So this is what happens with these individuals. They have pathological fractures that are localized in certain areas of the body, which we'll go over in a second. Now, because they have these pathological fractures, when you break down bone, what is released? Calcium. Cal uh, calcium. Well, osteo yeah, the osteoblast will break down the bone and actually release the calcium. So calcium will actually be released in the blood. These patients will have what is called hypercalcemia. So if you were to take their blood work, two things you're going to see already that we just talked about. They will have the antibodies that are present. They will also have the Bench Jones protein, which can also be present, and they can also have hypercalcemia. Okay, I'm sorry, three things, three things already. Hypercalcemia. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so bone damage and renal damage. Okay, so here we go. Antibody peak protein, hypercalcemia, and evidence of bone lesions. Okay. And the bone marrow biopsy is definitely there to confirm. Okay. Now, I know this looks crazy, this picture, but please keep in mind we are now in plasma, okay, so we are not looking at blood, okay, so this is plasma, so hence the reason why the background looks a little different here, okay. So, despite the color, if we look at these cells here, okay, especially this one here, what is the problem? There's two nuclei. Okay, now that tells us right there that there's some sort of abnormal mutation going on if you have two nuclei sitting in the cell. Okay, so and that is supposed to be, this is malignancy which telling us that this is a, a mature cell. And for a mature cell to have two nuclei, that's not a good situation. Okay, so this is definitely a mature plasma cell. Okay. And this tells us definitely right there the malignancy. Here's another one that has two nuclei. Okay. And these other ones do have sort of odd shape because the nucleus is not sitting center. It's actually kind of off. If you can tell, it kind of looks like little eyeballs. Okay. Um, that is our multiple myeloma. Okay. Now the onset of this is slow. It is a chronic disease, so it takes a long time for it to progress. Okay. But when it does progress, these patients will definitely have all of those signs and symptoms that I just showed you, especially all of those uh, clinical, excuse me, manif manifestations. Okay. So, that's pretty much that. Now, the diagnosis here, with routine examination during the asymptomatic phase, they will have the protein and the uh, calcium in, protein in the urine and calcium in the blood. Now, the first symptom is usually bone pain, and this is very true with these patients. They will have bone pain at first. Then they'll recognize, okay, something may be wrong, and then all the other testing usually will follow. Okay, then they'll start having infections and other kind of immune compromised things that go along with the cancer. Okay. 
Renal insufficiency, we already talked about this. So because of the fact that these large proteins that is trying to pass through the kidney, they will have kidney damage, okay? And sometimes they can lead to uh, renal failure, okay, if it gets that bad. Now, the other thing here is bone involvement. So I told you that they will have pathological fractures. They will have what is called honeycomb appearance, okay, which means, and I'll show you a picture in a second, which means that you'll see the destruction of the bone, and it almost looks like sort of blown out lesions, okay. So they will be in the ribs, spine, skull, and pelvis. Please make sure you know the four different areas that they are more prone to getting fractures. So here's a picture of vertebrae and the skull. So when we look at the skull over here, what happens here? Oh, well let me just explain to you if you don't know. When you're looking at an x-ray, when you're looking at bone, bone because bone has a higher density, it actually will show up as white on some film on x-ray. And then if you're looking at something like a soft tissue, it'll actually show up sort of like a darker, blacker, black, I shouldn't say black, but more of a darker appearance, not as white, okay, because the density is lower. So just to let you know. Now, when you look at the skull here, what is the issue? Dark spots, so you see this sort of blown out lesions here. This is what we call the honeycomb appearance. Now, just to let you know, if you look at this skull all together and look at the coloring, even if it didn't have these blown out lesions, this skull is not as white as it should be, okay, which tells us that the bone density in this person is not great, okay, so, you know, people do get bone density scans and things of that nature to tell bone density, but you can even tell bone density just by looking at an x-ray film as well. So, this is definitely not good bone density here, okay, this area still has a good amount but the rest of this is not good, okay? But in any event, we do have those honeycomb appearance or those lesions that are sticking out here in the skull. Now, when we look at this vertebrae, what is the issue here? Okay, so the dark spots or the blown out honeycomb appearance that is in the body of the vertebrae and also a little bit here on the transverse process, okay, as you can see. So it's usually, it's actually kind of like the whole vertebrae. What is another issue with this vertebrae here that's sort of a... It's incidental finding. <clears throat> it's weird. It's shaped right on the top. Okay, it's weird right here, which tells us what is going on that you think there. Growth. Thank you. It's a growth. Okay, so it's a growth, maybe a tumor growth, okay, that's just sitting there on the side of the vertebrae. So this is not really a part of the honeycomb appearance, but this is just a, 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 another finding that you can see here on this x ray. Okay. It's bone growth? <laughs> it could be bone growth. Honestly, I don't know what it is. It could be bone growth, but it is some type of growth. But I would say bone because the density is very white. Um, so sometimes what will happen is patients can have uh, different areas of where they'll have like an excess of bone growth in the area that where there is a little bit of bone destruction, like a combination, I don't want to say a combination of osteoporosis and uh, degenerative disease. But the body actually will react to not having, to having all that bone destruction to try to build more bone. So it could be just a situation like that. Or it could be a tumor. I'm not sure. Because bone tumors can also take on that sort of, well, bone tumors will start destroying the, um, well, that's to get too much into it. But bone tumors will actually start destroying the, uh, the outer portion of the bone, but not so much just sitting there like that. Okay, now, how do they treat this? They don't have a good chemotherapy regimen yet for this treatment, but what they will do is they will do a high dose of chemotherapy followed by an allogenic bone marrow transplant. Okay, that's actually the more common uh, thing that they're using, but just to let you know, they would prefer a patient to have the autologous stem cell. They feel that the autologous stem cell, if the patient has their own stem cell, their own plasma, all their own blood that's coming back in, they feel that that's the better treatment, but the problem is these patients are not healthy enough to get their own bone marrow, okay, back in or go through the autologous process. Um, but if they are healthy enough, they would prefer that over the donor, okay, just to let you know. Okay, 
and that's that. So pharmacology treatment for the renal disease. And for the bone pain, they would just give them pain relievers, you know, and try to um, take care of the bone lesions, and that's that. So we're done with the leukemias. And we will go over the last two things we have to go over are the lymphomas. I'm trying to finish this in 30 minutes and it didn't work out. It's just two lymphomas and then we're done. So we have two lymphomas that we have to go over, Hodgkin's disease and non-Hodgkin's. Okay, which I'm quite sure you may have heard of, maybe, maybe not. Now, this gives you the incidence here of Hodgkin's disease, so 30% malignant lymphomas occur somewhere between ages of 20 to 40, higher incidence of males, here we go again, so males are definitely more at risk. Um, and then they give you the survival rate. Okay, now, this is what I call a hallmark gift. I was just wondering, is there any reason why males are more? I don't know. Um, the only thing I can think of, just logically thinking, is that men tend to have more blood volume, which tells me that they have more blood. So maybe they just have more circulating than females, which is not much more, but that's the only thing I can think of. I, I don't know exactly why. Or it could be some genetic type of thing too that males in their genetic makeup are just more prone to getting leukemias. <clears throat> Not to say that females don't get it, but they're more, um, there's usually more of an um, incidence of males. Okay. okay, now with Hodgkin's disease, uh, what happens here, so what happens here, these individuals do have what is called a Reed-Sterberg cell, okay? I would highlight that. I will let you know that that is considered the hallmark, I would say, for this particular disease. Um, and I'll show you what we mean by a reed sterberg cell in a second. It's just a type of cell that is identified with these individuals that have Hodgkin's disease. So it definitely originates from B cells, okay, and I'll show you what it looks like, and the centers of lymph nodes. So when we take a look at this, this is also a different type of tissue. So the cell is going to, the, the slide is going to look different. So this is malignant, but it does have a particular pattern the way it grows, okay? So when a person has a lymphoma, um, it is sort of easy to go through that whole TNM process, okay, or the staging process because it has a particular pattern. Okay, so when a patient is diagnosed or when they do have what is called this type of Hodgkin's disease where these, uh, the malignancy attacks the lymph nodes, so what will happen here is that they will have sort of um, a presentation that's like this. So not that it'll go in this order, um, well, it may go in this order, but it will be classic like this, okay, from my understanding. So here you have two cervical lymph node chains, then you have the axillary. Then down here you have the abdominal and then the inguinal lymph nodes. This presentation, this person just has one cervical and abdominal. Over here, he has two cervical and then the abdominal and inguinal. And then over here, he has cer both cervical, both axillary, abdominal, and both inguinal. Okay, so this is definitely more of a severe situation, or let's just say late stage. Okay. And from my understanding, and just from talking to, um, I believe one student said she knew someone that had Hodgkin's, and then talking to one of the nursing faculty, from my understanding, when you see a person with Hodgkin's, it is textbook like this. So this is the classic presentation of how it will come to you. Okay. Now, 